Hello fellow fat fingers. Today I'd like to share with you an obscure little indie game that's going on about 10 years old. The game in question is a 5 to 10 minute walking simulator with a violent twist, New Inspector. This game was created by little known indie developer Jake Clover, who is most famous for his similar walking simulator, Sluggish Morse. <laughs> Sluggish Morse got pretty big by indie standards, and remember, this is back in 2012, before the likes of Five Nights at Freddy's and Undertale found mainstream success. Sluggish Morse is actually a series of games, with Clover only developing the first one, which continues to be my favorite. Jake Clover says he didn't like how the game turned out, and that he thought it was too flashy. I'd show you the interview in which he said that, but you'll just have to take my word for it since the interview was published in a small indie game publication that's been lost to time. If I do manage to find it, I'll put it on screen in a second. I can see why Jake might have thought that Sluggish Morse didn't properly represent his style since it's quite a bit different than a lot of his other works, but I still really like the game and I think he should be proud of it. More on the subject of Jake Clover. I really like all of his work, and I desperately want his games to get more attention. He's been developing and publishing games for over 10 years on Game Jolt, and more recently, Glorious Trainwrecks. Going a little bit off topic, Glorious Trainwrecks is a site that serves as a platform for indie game developers who are discontent with modern mainstream indie gaming. Glorious Trainwrecks seeks to embolden the avant-garde ruggedness of indie gaming as it was in its early days. In their own words, Glorious Trainwrecks is about bringing back the spirit of post-cardware, circa 1993. It's about throwing a bunch of random crap into your game and keeping whatever sticks. About bringing back a time when you didn't care so much about production values as much as ripping sound samples from your favorite television shows to use in your game or animating pictures of yourself making goofy faces on your webcam. With every ridiculous idea you had, you would just sit down and code when you would make up a company name to legitimize dorking around on the computer with your friends. It's not about unfinished, unplayable games. If any part of a glorious train wreck is terrible, it is terrible in a way that is AWESOME. And I think that is, in fact, awesome. With the mainstream success of games like Undertale, which I did talk about on this channel in a video that you should totally watch. It's easy to forget that indie games are an extremely broad category, bringing together and inspiring artists from all over the world. Indie games don't have to be anything specific. They don't have to exist for profit, as is the case with AAA gaming, which has become so bogged down by vapid and incessant monetization that it's just a complete cesspool. My hatred for the current state of AAA gaming is pretty comprehensive and may deserve a video of its own at some point. Indie games exist because developers want to make them, and I think that's how games should be. Because indie developers aren't beholden to major publishers who seek to gouge them for all their worth, sacrificing creativity for marketability, Glorious Trainwreck seeks to break away from that disturbing trend. If you're a fan of chaotic, unchained creativity, I'd highly recommend checking out Glorious Trainwreck's library. Focusing back on the main topic, Jake Clover. His games are very much in line with the spirit of Glorious Trainwrecks. It's hard for me to describe Clover's library in just a few words, because he makes all sorts of games with varying length and production values. The only way for me to adequately describe Clover's body of work would be to make separate videos on all of his games, or at least his most noteworthy ones. I might even do that should I manage to scrounge together the time. <laughs> As such, that's totally beyond the scope of this video. For now, I'll just be focusing on New Inspector. I first played New Inspector back in 2013, only a year after its release. Back then, I was playing on a crappy Dell Latitude from 2005, because that's all I had. Ah, uh, those were the days, back when I didn't have to worry about college, politics, or the imminent collapse of Western civilization. <laughs> In beginning my dive into New Inspector, let us examine its page on Game Jolt. The description reads as follows. An atmospheric experiment. Make sure to have sound on, use arrows, and Z. The page also has a set of quotes about the game from people who probably don't actually exist. I'm willing to bet that those quotes are just funny descriptors made by Clover himself to further flesh out the game. Two of the three quotes aren't very important for our goals, but I'll come back to the first one. On to the game itself. It opens with just a screen depicting white text on a black background. The text reads, My actions had attracted a specter. Oh dear. 
That sounds like quite the predicament. The game then cuts to the first screen in the game proper. The main character is standing on the left side of what appears to be a living room. To the far right of the room, a figure lays on the floor. Unconscious or dead. Probably dead. On the armchair in this room, there's a shotgun. The main character takes a minute before starting his quest to smoke a cigarette, perhaps wary of the journey he's about to embark on. He drops a cigarette, picks up his cane, and the game begins. Right away, you'll notice two things. One, the art style. The game's art style appears to be based on simple paper cutout art, kind of like South Park. That's not a big deal or anything, just something cool I wanted to make note of, since that's not something you see many games do. The second thing you'll notice immediately is the sound design. The first sound you hear in the game is a blaring, jazzy song playing in the background. The song is muffled, as if it's playing from another room, but you never see this room if it exists. This moment here, where you begin the game and you hear that song playing, is perhaps one of the most effective uses of sound to build atmosphere I've ever seen in a game. Right off the get-go, this scene puts you in the mindset that will persist throughout the rest of the game. Unease. I don't know if it's just me, but there's something really eerie about how the muffled music blares in the distance from an unidentifiable source that just gets to me. It makes this alarm go off in my head that something's wrong and that I need to leave. It's hard for me to put this into words, and perhaps Jake Clover was aware of this feeling when constructing this scene. I know I'm harping on this, but I want you to understand, this part of the game stuck with me. Also, I noticed while editing this video and collecting the footage that the song in the first room loops, and when it loops, you can hear a noticeable transition. It sounds kind of like a symbol or something being hit when it uh, starts over again. I'm not sure if this is intentional or not on Clover's part, but I just thought I should draw attention to it here. I, I don't really know what to make of it. I'll play it a few times here so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to come back to this point about the music later in the video, so we'll put a sticky note on that for now. Upon entering the room to the left, the player will find another baffling sight. A strange black creature with a twisted face sitting at a table. In this room, you can still hear the muffled song, albeit noticeably more distant. This black creature is likely the Spectre referred to in both the title and the introduction. The Spectre will occasionally bang on the table, as if it wants something. It's got a plate and some silverware, so it's not hard to figure out that it probably wants something to eat. Do specters even need to eat? No, seriously. Ask yourself that question, because that's going to come back later. Going back into the main room, you'll want to pick up the shotgun, because you're sure as hell going to need it. Another important note to make is regarding the shotgun. If you pick up the shotgun and return to the room with the specter, the specter will pull out its own shotgun and attempt to kill you. From here, two things can happen. Either you kill the Spectre, or the Spectre kills you. If the Spectre kills you, the game restarts, the same as if you're killed by any other enemy. If you kill the Spectre, the game immediately ends, showing you the final screen. I won't dive into the final screen yet, as that's the end of the game. We'll get to that in due time. In the next room to the right, you'll continue hearing the faint music as it was in the Spectre room. The most notable thing about this room is the picture on the wall portraying two wolf-headed creatures. One of them, probably the tall one, is likely the main character. This guy, whoever he is, probably has a family. It's not really important to the story, just something I noticed. In the next room, the most notable object is a clock. You hear the clock ticking. The music is now gone. The ticking clock is very oppressive, as if to tell the player that time is running out and that you need to act quickly. The final room in the house has two notable objects, a table with some type of card and a broken window. The card on the table is an object you need to pick up, though that's not immediately clear to the player. The object is crucial to finishing the game, and that's really the only complaint I have about New Inspector. It doesn't really explain itself very well, even when it needs to. 
That's probably an intentional decision made by Clover, but I think it does itself a disservice by not signaling to the player this object's importance. Maybe if it were flashing, indicating to the player that you need it, that would have been better. As I said, though, that's my only complaint about the game. On to the broken window. I think it's pretty clear what the implication is here. Your house, the main character's house, was broken into by the purple and black wolf that was lying on the floor in the starting room. The main character shoots the intruder, and that action is likely what attracted the specter. Exiting the house, you're greeted with a dark nightscape. In the distance, there's a far-off city. Here, if you didn't notice before, you'll probably detect the flashing effect that's present on all of the scenery in the game. While I can't say for certain what the intention was here, I interpret this flashing to be a reference to old films. Back when people used film reels to screen movies, there was a noticeable flashing from the projector. I think the idea here is to present New Inspector as if it's some old-time crime thriller and you're watching the movie play out. The other thing that's notable about this segment is the train whistle you hear in the distance. Once again, the brilliant sound design makes itself known. The train whistle here is haunting, to say the least. It solidifies the idea touched upon by the distant city that the main character lives in a desolate area, not super far from civilization, but far enough to where you are most definitely alone. It makes you feel isolated, and that isolation lends itself to the already tense atmosphere the game has built up. In the next segment, you see a church and some telephone lines in the background. This sort of continues the theme presented by the last scenario, Distance from Civilization. There are people in this world going about their lives as this is all happening, but they're not going to interfere with this event. In the next quote-unquote room, you'll pass some dead-looking trees. These dead-looking trees seem unfriendly, to say the least. Perhaps they're warning you of the danger ahead. In the next room, you'll encounter New Inspector's first enemy, not including the Spectre itself. At first, it appears as though this room just contains a rock and another dead tree. Upon approaching this rock, it jumps up and attacks you. Uh-oh, it's not a rock, it's a bear. The logical next step is to fire the shotgun and neutralize the threat. The purpose of the scene is to really introduce you to the shotgun, and, oh boy, does it make itself known. When you fire the shotgun, the screen jitters out of focus, the camera jolts to the side, and the main character gets knocked back from the recoil. This is another important aspect of the game, violence. There's no blood or gore in this game, but the violence is brutal nonetheless. Firing that shotgun is a violent act. It's a permanent act. Later in the game, you'll notice that when you fire the shotgun indoors, the pellets perforate the wall, and those bullet holes don't go away upon exiting the room. When you fire that shotgun, you make a permanent change to this world. Just like in real life, if you kill somebody in New Inspector, that person is dead, and they're not going to respawn. This theme of violence is pretty crucial to the experience, and it really bolsters the tense mood. Aside from the bear attack, there is another important detail in this segment. The music. It's muffled, like the music at the start of the game, but it's there, and you'll hear it clearly in the next room. This next room is also a very important facet of the game. Entering this room, you'll be greeted with a large, fat tree with glowing orbs dangling from its branches. To the left of the tree, there's a sign beckoning you forward. To the right of the tree, there's a large, horn-shaped figure. Immediately, once you enter the room, the figure opens its eyes and mouth, revealing itself to be alive. It then fades away, just as quickly as it appeared. The thing that strikes me most about this figure is its similarity to the specter, specifically the specter's head. I believe this object is a deliberate nod to the specter. Perhaps this figure isn't even real, but a figment of your imagination. A symbol for the sudden and oppressive intrusion the specter has made into your life. Combine that with the otherworldly glowing orb tree and the sign beckoning you forward, and I think the symbolism is clear. You just embarked on a journey to satiate the specter that was summoned by the death of the intruder, and now, whether you want to continue or not, you'll have to keep going forward. You just killed a bear in the previous room, and you killed the intruder earlier. Blood is on your hands, and there's no turning back. To put it frankly, you're in deep shit. The other thing I want to touch upon is the music that you just started to hear in the previous room. Here, the music can be heard very clearly. Clearer than the music at the beginning of the game. The 
song isn't pleasant to listen to. It churns. It thumps. It sounds industrial and burdensome. I might be wrong about the music being clearer here, but this is just my interpretation. It just sounds that way to me. I believe the intention here is as follows. The music at the beginning of the game was muffled and distant, but this overbearing and unnerving omen of a song is explicit. It's right in your face. This is a deliberate parallel referencing the quick escalation of events. You started off going about your night listening to music at a low volume, when suddenly your peaceful night was ripped apart, and now you're searching for a way out, and you're gonna have to get your hands dirty to do it. By the point in the game when you encounter the second song, you're in the thick of it. Your experience isn't passive and routine anymore. Your heart is pounding, and thoughts are racing through your head at an unnerving speed. And that's what this song personifies. In the next segment to the right, you'll approach the supermarket, this area being the final stretch of the game. There are a few things to mention about this screen. First, the sky. It has three moons. One big moon, one still big but not quite as big moon, and a small moon. This is actually a common theme in Jake Clover's games, science fiction. Being a longtime fan of Mr. Clover's games, I can tell you that he's a big fan of sci-fi, so it's no surprise to see he incorporated just a little bit of that here. The intent with the moons, I think, is just to establish that this world the game takes place in is most definitely not Earth. Perhaps it's some far-off alien planet inhabited by these wolf creatures that just so happens to be remarkably similar to Earth. The second thing I want to draw attention to on the screen is the neon market sign the letters of which are all out, except for the E. It flickers on and off, and you can hear the electricity flicker as it struggles to flow. That's just another example of the game's remarkable sound design. You can also hear the far-off churning music in the background. The market's closed, so you have to shoot the door open to progress. Entering the market, you'll discover a very strange white room with nothing but a security camera and a doorway. This doorway will be blocked unless you picked up the keycard in the beginning. That's kind of strange that the main character has a keycard to open this door, so perhaps he's somehow affiliated with the market? I don't really know for sure. In the next room, you'll find this supermarket gets even weirder. It's a very industrial looking room with a strange machine in the left corner, and a door marked by a caution sign on the right side. What kind of supermarket is this? What are they doing here? Is this normal on this planet? Perhaps so. I think this is just another example of Jake Clover incorporating weird sci-fi visuals into his games. Pretty cool. Another thing I'd like to mention about the supermarket is the noticeable ambiance in each room. The place is empty, but you wouldn't expect a supermarket to sound like this. The ambiance changes slightly between the rooms, but it's always there. It's possible that whatever variety of alien machinery is behind the caution door could be the source of the ambiance. We may never know. The next room is the final new room in the game. This one's the supermarket proper, with jars of, presumably, food on the shelves. There's one employee standing at the counter, probably closing up after hours. Approach this guy, and he'll pull out his own shotgun, whether or not you bring your own gun. It's kind of strange that he'd shoot you even if you were unarmed, but he probably heard you shoot the door open to come in, and he's assuming that you're trying to hurt him. Take him out before he gets you, and the market's ripe for the plundering. Before you grab the cart and load up, there's one more thing you need to be wary of, though. When you leave the supermarket, there will be another guy waiting outside to kill you. This is another strange thing that I don't readily have an explanation for. Maybe he also works for the supermarket and just heard you break in. His color scheme is the same as the intruder from the beginning, so maybe he knows that guy and is trying to avenge him. Was he trailing you the whole time to figure out what you were up to? I can't say for certain. He's the final enemy in the game, so once you deal with him, you're free to complete your objective. Grab the shopping cart and load it up, and head back to the start. After you get through the long walk home, you'll return to the room with the Spectre. He's still hungry, and you're about to feed him. Place some food on its plate, and then what? You've completed your objective, so all you can do is leave the room. Okay, you left the room. What now? You might wander around for a bit, wondering what to do next. Well, now that a little bit of time has passed, I guess we should check up on the Spectre. Maybe it's finished with its meal.
Come back into the room and you'll immediately hear glass shattering, and you'll see the specter climbing out the window. The plate is also broken on the ground, and the food is gone. Once the animation finishes, you'll get the final ending screen, the one that I mentioned earlier if you choose to kill the specter. The final screen, in white text on a black background, simply reads, The specter is no more, and the game ends. Wait a minute, the specter is no more? We just saw him climb out the window, he didn't just disappear. Was it even a specter at all? You're probably left with more questions than answers, but consider this. Remember the quote that I said we'd come back to from the Game Jolt page? Here's where everything comes together. The quote from somebody named Ataps, who probably doesn't really exist, states the following. It's kind of like reading a good supernatural thriller and then finding out the ghost was really just Old Man Withers in a mask. Wait a minute. A good supernatural thriller where the ghost wasn't really a ghost? That's kind of like what we just witnessed, with the quote-unquote specter jumping out the window as soon as it got what it wanted. I believe the implication based on the quote and the game's ending is that the specter was not in fact a specter. It was some weird penguin-looking fellow who saw what just happened with you killing the intruder, and decided to take advantage of the situation by posing as a specter and demanding that you bring it food in order to exorcise it from your home. Was that it? Did you really just kill all those people and bears for nothing? Maybe. Or maybe it really was a ghost, and it just decided to leave through the window. Like I said, this game leaves you with more questions than answers, and that's a great thing. Perhaps now you understand why this game has been in my thoughts so much for the past ten years. The whole experience is only a couple minutes long, but man, does it leave an impact. The atmosphere, the sound design... The open-ended narrative, it's astonishing to behold what Jake Clover has managed to achieve in just a short amount of time. This game stuck with me. It truly is an atmospheric experiment, and whatever Clover set out to achieve, I think it's best to say he did it. I hope that in making this video, I have piqued your interest into Jake Clover's work. I'd highly recommend you check out some of his other games, as a lot of them are also very interesting. Some particular works I'd like to recommend are his Some Games collection, Gulla Gulla, Space Pirate Dernchus, and Death of the Og Knob. None of them are particularly long, and they're all free. If nothing else, I hope that I've drawn some much-deserved attention Clover's way, as I think a lot of people will find his work to be quite fascinating. Damn, I think this video's technically been 10 years in the making. If you like this analysis, subscribe for more hard-hitting content, leave a like if you enjoyed it, and please, please, please send some love Jake Clover's way. I really enjoyed making this video, as I finally got the opportunity to voice some thoughts that have been buzzing in my head for quite some time. Anyway, this is your man Fatfinger, signing off.